Yo. Yo, son, come on. Yo, Omar coming, man. If there's any character on The Wire who most embodies the power and elegance of living by a personal code, it's Omar Little, the favorite character of President Obama. Omar's, by the way, my favorite character. Omar is the Robin Hood of The Wire in a very literal way. He makes his living by robbing the hood, stealing from drug dealers, and giving back to his community. Hey, Mr. Omar, my check late. Hey, yo, Mike. Hook a sister up, yo. Omar feels almost mythical because it seems impossible to do what he does and stay alive. Mr. Little, how does a man rob drug dealers for eight or nine years and live to tell about it? <sighs> Day to time, I suppose. And Omar's superpower is really his code. I mean, there are some rules here, right? Rules? Yeah. No mistakes, no bystanders. No taxpayers getting caught up in the mix. Yes, he steals and kills. But we respect Omar as a moral character because he shows courage, integrity, and a coherent worldview through living by the rules he's made for himself. Ultimately, Omar shows what the basic worth of a code is. It offers us the freedom to live as ourselves without fear or regret and doing justice to our deepest personal values. And look, I ain't never put my gun on no citizen. Before we go on, we're excited to tell you about this video's sponsor, Vincero. Vincero makes luxury watches with an attention to detail and focus on craftsmanship that you won't find anywhere else, all at an affordable price. And if you use our special code, PRISM15, you get 15% off your order. So click the link in the description below and treat yourself. Omar is the character who first raises the importance of having a code when he tells Bunk about his most unbreakable rule. I mean, don't get it twisted. I do some dirt too, but I ain't never put my gun on nobody who wasn't in the game. A man must have a code. Everyone involved with the Baltimore drug trade, the various hierarchies of lieutenants, soldiers, corner boys, junkies, and cops are all part of the same game, and they know what the rules are. All in the game, yo. <laughs> All in the game. Omar doesn't hesitate to rob or kill anyone he has to in this ecosystem because that's a risk they consent to in being part of this game. But the game is out there, and it's either play or get played. But Omar bristles, offended at the suggestion that he would ever harm someone who has made no such implicit agreement. In this context, Omar's moves are all fair game. They just happen to be incredibly risky, as he's an individual going up against the house. Omar later calls back to his conversation with Bunk when he's been locked up for a crime Marlowe's people framed him for, and he reminds Bunk of Bunk's own code. Since you're feeling all biblical and righteous and all, you think on this. Now, if Omar ain't killed that delivery lady, somebody else did. But you're giving him a free walk right now, though, ain't you? A man got to have a code. Omar and Bunk don't have to see eye to eye on everything, but each person should be true to his own code, and this allows for balance and harmony in the game. In Omar's eyes, the rules of fair play must be upheld. And when these rules are broken due to human weakness, plotting, or greed, there must be swift punishment. See, that boy was beautiful. When no need for you to do him the way y'all did. Together with other veterans of the game like Prop Joe and Bodhi, Omar can't stand when newcomers don't respect how it's played. And for as long as I've been grown, once a month, I've been with her on a church Sunday, telling myself ain't no need to worry because ain't nobody in this city that low down to disrespect a Sunday morning. Omar is also a virtuoso of sorts. He relishes doing what he does well, and it's important to him to stay sharp and on top of his game. As much as he hates Stringer and Avon, he's concerned to see that the Barksdale Empire is fading because he needs a worthy foe to keep up his skills. It ain't what you're taking, it's who you're taking it from, you feel me? How you expect to run with the wolves come night when you spend all day sparring with the puppies? Omar is a one-man force of justice in an unjust world. 
He's a correction. These drug kingpins like Avon Stringer and Marlowe are more or less untouchable. But Omar is here to throw a kink in their plan and their pleasure. They might seem like gods or devils out of the law's reach, but he can just walk in with a shotgun, cost them millions of dollars, undermine their reputation on the street, and most crucially in this game of ego, make them look like fools. I like that ring too. Almost everything else we witness on The Wire proves that life isn't fair. So Omar is uniquely satisfying to us because he does at times actually get to put things right. When Omar comes together with Brother Muzone to kill Stringer Bell, we see that these two characters are deeply alike. Not only are they two of the most rawly intelligent characters we meet, who take care in how they conduct themselves. You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right? Nigga with a library card. But also, most fundamentally, they share a sense of justice. The game is the game. Indeed. Omar chooses not to kill Brother Muzone once he realizes he's been given false information. So you know, what happened to your boy? It's not my style. Yeah, I want to report a shooting over here at the new motel on North Avenue. It matters very much to him that he's not killing the wrong man for a made-up reason, even if it's far riskier at this point not to kill this lethal man who's very likely to come back after him. But Brother Muzone likewise isn't interested in killing the wrong man, only the one who's responsible, the one who betrayed the rules of their agreed-upon game. When Stringer tries to bargain for his life by offering, of course, money... What y'all niggas want, man? Huh? Money. Omar's response shows how far his code is from Stringer's. You still don't get it, do you? Huh? It ain't about your money, bro. The boy gave you up. It's not about money or even truly just about vengeance. It's justice. <laughs> Omar is one of the smartest characters in The Wire. Now, that's what I think it is. A little clutch of chicken might be putting all the eggs up in one basket. But being the Robin Hood of West Baltimore might not immediately seem like the smartest choice, in that it's not a choice that guarantees you long life. So if Omar is as intelligent as we know he is, and if he's chosen the lifestyle that we know he has, this tells us there's something profoundly valuable in living as Omar does. Man gotta live what he know, right? After examining all of the options available to him, why has Omar chosen this path? Because it is the only path that offers freedom. The freedom to live as himself. The freedom to refuse to serve a king he despises. The freedom within a system in which most people feel they're completely trapped to shape his own life based on his own values. Omar chooses freedom, but he understands it comes at a price. Now, I'm doubling the bounty. Hunting large for a whiff of that 250 for his head. Omar accepts that this lifestyle comes with the constant danger of sudden death. And because he's made peace with the risks and downsides of his code, most powerfully, he's free from fear. Omar don't scare. Other characters pretend they're not what they are, but Omar is without pretense. What exactly do you do for a living, Mr. Little? I rob drug dealers. So another key freedom his code allows him is to express himself with total honesty, a precious and rare gift that few others get. I shot the boy Mike Mike in his hind paws, that all. <laughs> Fixed it so he couldn't sit right. He illuminates key rules of the game for us with eloquence. Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss. And he observes other players in the game with refreshing clarity. You're stealing from those who themselves are stealing the lifeblood from our city. You are a parasite who leeches off Just like you, the culture man. of drugs. Excuse me? What? I got the shotgun. You got the briefcase. It's on the game, though, right? Omar is also not materialistic, so he's free of the traps of greed for more money or fear of losing it. Money doesn't really mean anything to him, except for the pain that it causes these kingpins to see it taken. Now you make sure you tell old Marlow I burn the money. Cause it ain't about that paper. It's about me hurting his people and messing with his world. His biggest indulgence is a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios. You ain't got no Honey Nut.
Most people absorb a number of social rules from others around them without ever examining those shared assumptions. But Omar has essentially written his code from scratch without worrying about what anyone else thinks is normal or correct. Omar allows himself certain liberties that others in his world wouldn't ever consider. He has no qualms about testifying in court to take down Bird. Hey, yo, what up, Bird? Or cooperating with the police to take down Stringer. How far back you want me to go? Almost no other character could do this without being labeled a snitch. But law enforcement isn't Omar's enemy. How many times have you been arrested as an adult, Mr. Little? Sure, I done lost count. No, though, not to take it personal. Omar's sexuality is notable. Most of the society around him is based on performing hypermasculinity, but Omar is gentle and tender with the people he loves. And he doesn't even really put on macho shows in public either. So again, Omar just hasn't worried himself with the assumption in his community that a tough guy shouldn't be openly gay. Omar also imposes rules on himself that others don't care about. His personal code dictates a certain level of manners and etiquette. He doesn't curse. Hey, why you always got to talk like that, man? Boy. F this and F that. He stays calm. His speech is polite and civil. But the clue is Greek god of war. Ares. Greeks called him Ares. Same dude, different name is all. Ares fits. Thanks. It's all good. Omar develops a small alternative community around him who share in his free yet dangerous existence. The downside to his lifestyle, of course, is that no one can be close to him without becoming a target, and Omar suffers for his way of life. He has to live with the guilt that his loved ones were targeted and tortured by people who were trying to get at him. Where Omar at? So Omar's code ultimately makes him alone. Still, the people who love him and who enter into his alternative community do consent to this reality. Oh, I got you, baby, I got you. Go, go! Spread the word, darling. Omar back. Omar's power relies on his reputation. He is so respected and feared that if he goes out to buy cereal, he gets drug sashes thrown at him without even trying to rob anyone. Yet this scene in which he goes searching for Honey Nut and we see the power of his name also darkly foreshadows Omar's eventual death. Omar doesn't even need to carry a weapon here because he's protected by the shield of his almost mythic superhuman reputation. But underneath that, he's still just a human. Omar is killed finally, not by one of the kingpins who's been chasing him or anyone who sees him as the great Omar, but by Kennard, a small boy who's too young to really fear him and his name. Omar's death seems maddeningly random and avoidable at first, but it's actually not. It has to be this way. Just as Prop Joe, another established figure that we've come to think nobody would touch, is killed by the young comer Marlo. The establishment with its systems of trust and respect doesn't see youth coming with all of its vicious disrespect. And no one can get to Omar except for a little kid. We know that Omar was raised by his grandmother after becoming an orphan when he was young. A brief prequel released before season five showed young Omar's brother Anthony planning a robbery. And we hear these very unprophetic words spoken about Omar. Hey, man. Brother not cut out for this. Anthony eventually ended up in jail, and we know the lifestyle Omar went on to have. But we don't get much backstory in the actual show telling us details of how Omar got into this life. In season four, though, the character of Michael Lee maybe helps us connect a few of those dots. Got good signs on him. Big paws on a puppy, huh? <laughs> yeah, big paws on a puppy to a T. Young Michael gets noticed by Marlo and his second-in-command, Chris, because he's smarter than the others around him. He keeps a cool head, remains strategic, and quickly learns every lesson he's taught. Smart nigga. You always was. How you know? Y'all taught me. Get there early. Watching the series for the first time, we might expect Michael to become another Chris, or even a Marlo. But at the end of season four, Michael comes to the conclusion that he has to be an independent agent. And in the very last episode, he fills the hole left by Omar's death. We see Michael rob a drug dealer for the first time, and right after this, we hear the news of Omar's death making its way around the street. The real story about Omar? That a bunch of cats, man, look like the 
always killed him. It's interesting that Michael becomes Omar because we don't easily see this coming a long way away, but once it happens, it makes total sense. Chris and Snoop think Michael will be a good soldier, but they dislike that he asks too many questions. Cause he got a big the mouth, that's why. And you need to stop running your own mouth, youngin. He uses his brain, whereas an enforcer like Chris or Snoop pulls the trigger and doesn't ask, doesn't even worry that they might kill the wrong person. Michael is too smart and thinks too independently to just fall in line like a future Weebae. Beneath their cool-headed intelligence, both Omar and Michael are warm people motivated by deep emotions. They care more than anything about protecting and providing for their loved ones. Omar is after retribution for the grotesque murder of his love Brandon, and Michael starting crime is triggered by the return of his little brother Bug's dad, who the series strongly implies sexually abused Michael when Michael was a boy. You big. We're not big enough. This explains his distrust of both Marlo's offer of a free handout and Cuddy's offer to train him. What's wrong with Cuddy? I don't know. Like, he's just too friendly, you know? That shit creeped me out, man. And I don't know, he, he just too friendly, you know? Everybody just too friendly. Given what we know about Omar in the present and his ferocity in going after those who hurt his loved ones, we sense that as a child, Omar might have experienced some abuse and trauma as well. As Michael's story shows us why an intelligent and talented boy first enters crime, we come to understand that Omar's choice was probably a similar mix of emotional pain and logical response to an environment in which there isn't really another option. When Michael steps into Omar's shoes, perhaps we're mainly surprised because we've thought of Omar as such an individual that he seems irreplaceable. Omar's role in the system isn't just about him, though. It is a part of the system. Even if to us, there can only ever be one Omar. That's my money. Man, money ain't got no owners. Only spenders. We love Omar because he lives honestly without fear. His freedom comes from his great intelligence, making peace with the choice to be who he is and accept the consequences. And all of this makes The Wire's Omar Little a little bit of a miracle. Does Omar come back tomorrow? And the next day? And the next day? Hey guys, did you know that in Italian, vincero translates to I will win? These words really sum up the spirit of vincero's luxury watches. They're all about confidence, class, and believing you deserve the best. In a market full of mass-produced minimalist watches, Vincero is raising the bar with its process. They source all their own material, including genuine Italian leather, Italian marble, sapphire glass, and surgical grade stainless steel. Their watches are handcrafted and manufactured in small batches to ensure quality control. And they can afford to offer all of this for a fraction of the price of other luxury watches because they sell directly to customers. We actually have these watches ourselves, so we can testify to the true quality of what you're seeing. Vincero has lines for both men and women, and we love the elegance of the female line. A watch like this upgrades any look. We're not the only ones who love Vincero. They've received more than 12,000 five-star reviews on their site. So if you want a luxury timepiece at an affordable price point, look no further. Click the link in the description below to check out Vincero today. And don't forget to use our code PRISM15 to get 15% off your order.